Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 30, episode 30 of Alta Asks Live. I'm Beth Spotswood, Alta's digital editor, and I am very excited to welcome you today. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Alta, we're a quarterly journal, and we have been featuring the work of Obi Kaufman since issue one, I think, in Alta, which is um, I'm, we're, we're very proud of, and we called it early, I think. Um, Obi is an author, an artist, a naturalist, and I find him just overall generally inspiring. He's, um, he's created the California Field Atlas, the State of Water, and his third book, which is out now, is The Forests of California. This is part of a, a larger collection that Obi's doing, which hopefully he's going to talk about, and he's going to talk about that today with Matt Jaffe. Matt is an author, a journalist, and a contributor to Alta, a frequent contributor to Alta. In fact, I believe he's working on um, his fourth or fifth piece for us right now. Mm -hmm. So um, if you've got questions, we're gonna talk for about, I'm gonna get lost very quickly. We're gonna talk for about 25 minutes. Um, and if you've got questions, comments for either Obi or Matt, please ask them in the chat section or with the question button and I will, dig through those and the last five, 10 minutes, I'll pop back in and um, handle those, get to as many questions um, for either Obi or Matt as we can. Um, while you're here, please do check out altaonline.com. We launched our new website today. So um, go check it out and give it a spin. Tell us what you think. Most importantly, have a great time. Settle in for what is sure to be a really beautiful and inspiring conversation. I am excited to watch as a viewer. So um, with that, Matt and Obi, take it away. Okay. Thanks, Beth. Hi, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'm Matt Jaffe and um, talked to Obi a couple times in recent days and I've really been struck by his creativity and uh, had to cut off the conversation yesterday because we began going off in all sorts of different directions. As Beth said, he is a uh, writer, artist, and naturalist, but as I've discovered to reduce him to a word or two is a little bit like saying the sky is blue. It's true, but it hardly uh, tells the full story. So, um, and I had seen interviews with Obi before and digital versions of his book. And the other day, uh, Santa Ana winds blowing, hitting 79 miles per hour uh, on a peak near my house. I went over to pick up a copy of The Forest of California uh, that I'd put on hold at the bookstore. And when I was going to the bookstore, I was kind of anticipating something like this, an atlas. Hmm. And instead, the cashier comes out and hands me this. And I thought to myself, that is not the, the kind of atlas that I was expecting to find here. And um, it's really uh, an amazing book. Um, it's dense in feel and also very dense with details and art and, and information. Um, and when I got home, I had to clean up a bunch of branches from the eucalyptus um, in our front yard, spent some time doing that, and then I settled in with the Atlas. And it's not the kind of book that you sit down and read cover to cover. I think Obi would acknowledge that, that that's true. And so I opened it up, and what did I do? I opened it right up to the page on eucalyptus. So I thought that was a very good sign. And um, from there, I just kind of kept it random and got lost in the book for a few hours in the same way that when I was a kid, I used to look at uh, the encyclopedia and the golden nature books and, and some of those publications. And in some ways, that's how I learned about uh, it's my first exposure to nature, whether it's reptiles or birds. And this book had the same aspect of discovery and, um, and, I, and I loved it. And I think what Obi has done is he has somehow found that hard to reach crossroads where information meets inspiration and mm -hmm. uh, really thankful to him for that. And, um, and especially right now, because we're all living in much more constrained and smaller worlds. And um, the other afternoon, Obi, Obi opened my world back up and I think he'll be opening my world up um, for many more days to come. So thank you very much for that, Obi and welcome. Hey. Um, and, you know, again, um, this is not what I was expecting. I was just kind of curious, what was your 
process in terms of coming up with this sort of format? What do you think it does that maybe a more standard Atlas um, wouldn't be able to accomplish? Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Alta, for hosting this mm -hmm. excellent little venue here. I'm really grateful for this collected audience, this community. I wish that we could do this in person, of course. It's very I find I find this this medium this platform a little bit limiting of course you know when I'm I'm unable to look into everyone's eyes we're unable to to experience together that magic sort of alchemy that happens when uh, when community occurs you know as as I have traveled over the uh, the state over these past three years and I've um, encountered this electric network the these this this growing uh, consciousness of, of 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 community across a citizenry that is ready to, despite the hype, let go of so much of this divisive rhetoric that we're sold day in and day out, and really attend to what it is to actually be from this place. I find that that really happens when we can identify with each other's humanity, and we uh, we don't become reduced to comment lines in some social media network. The, the, I wonder sometimes if it's not fake news that we're listening to, but fake community that we've abdicated so much to the virtual platform of, of, of what is actually storytelling. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the field atlas is not based on any kind of argument, but based on the idea that the only way people's minds really change is through a good story. Mm -hmm. A better story, a better story than the one that we've been served, the one based on commodification of all things nature. In fact, that in many respects is the history of the West, the history of certainly the Western United States, the history of America itself from mm -hmm. extraction on all levels from resources, be they human or more than human. We, uh, I am would set out to 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 more clearly express my love and affection for the grander thing that is California mm -hmm. and set out to look at it from all kinds of different sides of my mind and what i found is that my mind itself reflected in and around the physiography, the natural workings of all of these living networks. So yeah, you're right. It's not, it's not an atlas like you might have expected in any other sort of context, Matt. You know, it's, it, I am not really concerned with uh, the wear of things. How about that? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's sort of funny to say for something calling itself an atlas. An atlas, right. Uh, I am more concerned with the how of things, you know, as a student of ecology, it is a brilliant and fascinating time. Ecology is a study that is wide open right now. What we don't know dwarfs what we do know. And I am engaged with that. And what I'm inviting my readership to do is to come along with me on that journey of discovery into this field. So I, this is not a textbook either you know so i'm not i'm not leaving you alone with the analysis i'm not leaving you alone with the data i am i'm absolutely um finding my voice in this subject matter right. and i am trust and i'm asking for your trust and uh, and more and more the more that i learn about this subject matter the more i know that i have to acknowledge I have to cite and I have to source every piece of knowledge and wisdom that I that I bring forth in these books um, to to a greater and greater degree. As I learn more, Matt, there's this funny thing that happens, and it's the nature of knowledge itself. As I learn more, I find that there is more to learn. And right. as I am going forward into these books, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of six books right now. I've got three. I'm working on my fourth one right now. And, uh, you know, in my whole like greater endeavor to make this sort of like Game of Thrones of California nature, you know, like this incredibly dense piece of lore and love um, about what makes this place tick with all of its adventure, all of its romance, all of its beauty. Um 
I am finding, and I have found to answer your question finally about uh, the format of this thing, right? The 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 spirit of the field atlas is really what the character of California is without humanity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in some ways, I'm almost like creating this sort of fantasy-like situation where as if like, as if you removed humans tomorrow, mm -hmm. what would still be here? What will be after that? And then what, what I do uh, in that regard is that I have created a whole negative space so by removing humanity, what I've done is actually I'm talking about humanity. I'm actually talking about um, the role that we fill in order to best understand our continued residency in this place. Going forward into the future, given what we've know, known in the past, all the great mistakes that we have made in the 170 years since that guy found that pretty rock in the river near our city's capital. You know, we have made a ton of mistakes and we are dealing with such a great time of reckoning right now that it, it would behoove us. In fact, it's necessary to engage in a holistic view to acknowledge those mistakes, those bad policies, those wrong turns that we have collectively invested in again and again towards so much injustice, not only to the natural world, not only to members of our own species, but to, how about this, the ghosts of our future children mm -hmm. and what we owe them. And those kind of ethical inquiries are at the core of this character that I'm chasing with the the genre really the invented genre that is the field atlas mm -hmm. so we had talked about the fact that you've you're, you're fundamentally optimistic um mm. the time when a lot of people are very pessimistic uh ah. fronts up with a lot of things i was curious this summer um as the skies turned orange over the bay area where you live <clears throat> we had the biggest fires in the state's history and certainly down here we're not out of the season yet how have you held on to your optimism um mm -hmm. as you look at the current situation when so many other people I, I think are feeling genuine despair that is such a good question matt we've got so many challenges challenges that are rooted in catastrophe at this present moment Where we go, the decisions that we make in the next 10 years are going to decide the quality of our, as I called it before, our continued human residency here in California for centuries to come. Mm -hmm. Now, what uh, what optimism is, in my opinion, actually, I draw that that um, that particular word from really entrepreneurial philosophy, like this idea of stubborn optimism, like it's the only way to make a business go, okay? Mm -hmm. Like there is no other choice, okay? I, I, I would even posit that, that to not be hopeful about the future is a, how about this, anti-democratic stance. Democracy is not... I consider democracy and I think that we should all as a citizenry consider democracy, not as a form of government, but as a way of life. Mm -hmm. And it is becoming clear as we're sort of in the, in the, in the, uh, in the vice grip of, of potentially neo-fascist forces really on from both sides of the equation that, we must listen to one another in order to find a way forward. And the way forward, and this is the thing that I'm optimistic about, is already laid out. We know what to do. We, yeah. or, you know, more appropriately, I would, I should say, we have a plan <laughs> forward 
because we understand the basic nature of what the source of the problems that we face are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and you can almost imagine like a, these problems as as I do as a, as a as a as a as like a stone dropped in a pond and they radiate outwards, right? So we've got we've got things at different scale, you know, from from the local to the regional to the national to the global, covering across the whole biosphere. Of course, I mean the the big problems, the most complex problems that include. Of course, you know, the big one, which would be climate change, or as I call it in the book, climate breakdown. Right. Uh, can you talk but, about, yeah. you know, the difference between those terms? Um, you know, how, what do you mean by climate breakdown? Well, climate breakdown, I think, is a more honest way of addressing the same problem that most people refer to when they use the term climate change. Climate change is a, seems to me like to be a little bit sort of anesthetized language. Right. Mm -hmm. What we're actually seeing with and, and, and it, you know, climate changes. What do you mean? Like from season, season, seasonality? You know, are we talking right. about phenology here? Are we talking about like, you know, is are the trees changing because of just just how they deal with their own seasonality in their own place? No, no, no. What we are finding is that uh, given. 1.1 degrees Celsius or whatever that we have we have now experienced on a global scale and we are experiencing in California and we are reckoning with right now because these are certainly climate fires as it's as as you know that perfect storm that hit us on October 13th with the lightning strikes as we're seeing a 12 percent increase in lightning strikes across California mm -hmm. in the past 70 years or so we're seeing we're seeing um we're seeing that heat wave, that heat wave that hit us right afterwards as well, uh, followed with, of course, a a, um, a desiccation of, of our vegetation. Uh, the the uh, increased evapotranspiration leads to drier fuel, and we get this perfect storm. We got this perfect storm. We just endured this perfect storm, and we're still not out of the fire season yet. Where, where over one third of all of the total land area that has burned in the past 100 years has burned within the past 10 weeks in right. California. Mm -hmm. This is a catastrophe, a completely predicted and predictable catastrophe, right? So when I say I'm optimistic, and that's not to be confused with idealistic, okay? I'm not inventing something here. I'm looking at the evidence. And the evidence based on good science is that we understand the source of so many of these problems, okay? And and for, forewarned is forearmed. You know, if we can get our act together, because make no mistake, this came out of intentional stuff. This came out of intentional phenomena that we unleashed. Mm -hmm. If we can face up and face together this idea, this these the the the, the fundamental the fundamental sources of these different kinds of conflagratory. Mm -hmm. problems we can get through this bottleneck and now mind you we are certainly in a bottleneck the momentum of what we have sown we will be reaping for quite a while right. and but but it's all about tending the miracle of what we have now and what we have now is a complete portfolio of bi of California's biodiversity going back to before the gold rush. You know, it's all still here. It's all endangered, but it's all still here. What about, um, and believe it or not, we only have a few minutes before we go, go to the questions. Um, it seems to me that one of the things that your books do is it helps people reconnect with their own personal geography. And that in combination with the fact that one of the things that fire does is it really acquaints you very quickly with what's around you. Um, mm. I live 
there's a large area of chaparral that goes down for several thousand acres right on the edge of my neighborhood. And you become very aware of it at this time of year. Um, do you see an aspect of kind of personal responsibility, and that sound like a Republican, about people really understanding through books like yours and through increasing their awareness, their understanding of where they live, whether it's a watershed where they live, whether it's a canyon where they live, um, and is that part of the solution to um, maybe getting us out of this this rut that we're in? Oh my God! Thank you. Yes, Matt. We engaging this idea of geographic literacy is 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 the thrust of this whole whole endeavor. I've got this little chat thing scrolling, and my buddy Pete just said something about phrenology. No, I was talking about phenology. That's that's the way that plants interact. How all organisms interact with their own seasonality. Okay, so that's I'm not talking about head head woo woo. Right. Is that what that is? Anyway. Um, uh yes going going back to love and hope right where where do these things come from people protect what they love people love what they understand and what they know what they're familiar with what they have relationships to uh my dear friend and colleague uh john muir laws and teamed up recently with the poet Emily Ligren to make a book called How to Teach Nature Journaling. And this is uh, a recommendation for everyone, not just because I share a publisher with them, Heyday Books, but, uh, but the idea of how to better engage with, um, with one's immediate environment, how to become from a place, how to get to know that place, you can't help but fall in love with it. And ultimately, all of these books that I make are love stories. You know, I started my first book, The California Field Atlas, with the sentence straight up that said, this is a love story. My third book, The Forest of California, is that this is a family album. Mm -hmm. my, my next book, The Coasts of California, will be that this is a time capsule. So now I'm, I'm going into uh, the... Uh, phenomena of the phenomenology really of what is here now and how it will change and how it has changed. So in, in the sort of context of space and time is where I find uh, not only the most fascinating story I've ever heard or um, have had the honor to tell, but the only one I can think of telling. And what a subject it is this 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 place this california this uh, as complex robust deep and alive as it is i could and i hope i wish i had the ability to to sing all day long to it and about it mm -hmm. it is if i could make a hundred maps a day for the rest of my life, I would still not have enough time mm -hmm. to tell all the stories right. that I want to tell. Yes, uh, I think California is more than just a state of mind. <laughs> and, and I think your, your books have really captured that. Um, well, I think we're actually ready to start taking some of the questions from the people on, on the sessions. So, um, we, yeah. I have to kind of get out of my leg listening to all of this and get back to work here. Um, Omi, this question comes from Will Hurst, Alta's publisher. Uh, mm. Do you consider yourself an artist, a journalist, a cartographer, an encyclopedist, or none of the above? And um, what will you explore next? Oh, how 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 we so easily fall into the isms. Um, yeah, what 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 tradition do I come from? Right, that's that's the question. I don't have much of a tradition, or at least, or at least, it's difficult for me to say. You know, I mean, I've um, I've been reading. Uh, let me show you this book, which is which is a must for everybody right now. It's Strength to Love by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And that that's a that's a Christian tradition. And a black tradition, two things that I 
don't know much about, um, but I'm learning, especially in this context of, of this new, this new post, this new world of catastrophe that I find myself, in, you know, having, having reconciled and every day waking up to reconciling with, with my own privilege and my own uh, attitude, my voice towards this thing called nature, which is, which is, uh, a a a a calling and a and and a reaction namely to my family i am who i am because i i had two science scientists for parents my father was an astrophysicist and my mother was a clinical psychologist and and i um and my you know dr kaufman's son was going to be a mathematician uh and yet i couldn't pull myself away from the uh the oak forests of mount diablo uh uh, but uh, uh, you know, long enough to 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 really give that the time that it needed, and I feel I feel the same way about like uh, um, this particular bent of of say Christianity. Like I don't I do not have the ability to to follow Jesus like Doctor King did. You know, I mean that is such an ask on one's own like moral and ethical character, and yet sometimes all the time i'm i'm wrestling with these ideas as far as environmental justice goes as far as um uh certainly the idea that there can be no environmental justice without racial justice we let you know lifting up our voices together and doing this together is going to take everyone and by everyone i mean everyone and so optimism is always tempered with this idea of hope you know and and hope we've got lots of hope we are we are good uh, americans we um we've got the hope and the hope will be there the reason why hope is such an excellent actionable tool is that it will be there regardless of say who's sitting in the white house which is something that's all in our minds right now of course um what regardless of who wins we are going to get up january 1st and we are going to go to work to continue this march to realize justice and uh so what am i i gosh if i could be a artist uh in the service of justice like that feels much better than any sort of like uh like uh you know um, um, other kind of ism that I could ascribe to myself, you know, I mean, I, I often like to think about what I'm not, you know, and uh, I'm not a scientist. I, 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 as I say, this, this book is full of, these books are full of cognitive bias from one perspective or another, you know, I am, I am dealing with a synthesis of data driven art to propel a story that I not only believe, as I said, not only believe needs to be told, but it's the only one I can think of to tell. Um, we we're getting so many good questions. Roxanne has asked, would you speak a bit about forest recovery post fires? Mm. Oh, I love to speak about forest recovery post fires. So I am uh, in two weeks, I'm going to be uh, uh, working with the Semper Virens Fund. They're, they're letting me into some old growth um, that burned in the CZU fire near Big Basin. And we're doing a big live walk. And you can go to CaliforniaFieldAtlas.com to join me on that walk. And I will be discussing the legacy of fire. You know, Matt, you're, I'm talking to you there from the Santa, Santa Monica Mountains where you are. And, uh, and your little corner of the state is the only corner of the state that has had too much fire in the past 100 years. The rest of the state up here in Northern California, we've had not enough fire. So what is good fire? What is bad fire? What is the nature of policy? What is the nature of colonial violence? What is the nature of climate breakdown within these systems of fire regime naturalized within the old growth forest? What are the techniques ecologically that the system has to, to deal with that? And also, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? How do we turn it around so we're not spending billions and billions of dollars to clean up the ashes of those 31 precious human souls that have died in 2020 from the, uh, you know, these, these, these human, 
human made climate fires. How do we clean up? How do we get that money in front proactively towards, towards a naturalized system that, uh, that, that we can interact with in a way that the fire comes and washes over us in our environment, as opposed to coming and destroying our human, our human infrastructure, the same sort of infrastructure that we would build in like Iowa, <laughs> you know, like we, this is different. California is different. Edward Abbey so rightly said there was a reality and then there's California. California is so such an island unto itself. I didn't say that, but it, I, what I mean is I didn't coin that term. It's been thought of as an island by ecologists and biologists for uh, as long as there has, has, as long as modern science has, has understood the physiography of uh, the botanical province itself. Uh, Mary in LA asks, um, uh, and it's actually, it's really cool. Everyone for, it, it rarely happens in our Alta Asks Live, but we should do it. Um, people have been chiming in. We've got New York City, San Francisco, Eureka, Sacramento. Um, it's really cool to see where everyone is all over the place. Mary in LA asks, um, other than reading your books, what's a good first step for someone who wants to be a better steward of our precious land and resources? Uh, a good first step, a good first step is asking yourself, what kind of story are you telling yourself about the person you want to be as you interact with this larger living, the living body of California? You know, I think that I've got and I've got a lot of friends and I've been guilty of this at certain points in my life, too, who tell their, themselves a story that to be a good citizen, you have to build a life around the idea of sitting in a car for two hours in the morning, going and sitting in front of a computer for eight hours and then going in, back into that car. And you're not in you and you do that five, six, seven days a week. Is that is that. Is that a good story to tell? Are you grounded? Are you centered? Are you unpanicked? Because if, and I see it so much in, in, in my presentations where people are white knuckled asking exactly that question, what can I do? And I say things like that. I say things like, I ask the question then, when was the last time you went camping? Like get out for and find that cold, clear, clean river and put your feet into it take your boots off and breathe deeply because whatever comes next whatever comes next oh my goodness in this moment of anxiety whatever comes next we're going to need you grounded we're going to need you centered and we're going to need you unpanicked because if you think 2020 was weird 2020 was training for 2030 you know yeah it i, I hey you know the, but but Again, <laughs> that, that recoils in horror. Oh, it's true. We optimism is based in you have to look at the data. You have to predict what is happening. But because of that, because we're in this together, and if we can acknowledge that we're in it together, and I have hope. And there's that actionable word again. And I have hope that we can work on this together that we can finally and that's the opportunity that's the great opportunity that all this conflagration this catastrophe gives us the great opportunities to transform and to reset just like the forest itself is doing right now we are in our own hearts seeing past and this is despite the rhetoric you know despite the rhetoric what is really happening and I've done a lot of these and I've talked to a lot of people and I am talking, I'm, I'm actually spending too much time talking to people. I should be writing more. I got deadlines for this next book, but I really believe in my heart and I see it in the community that from Fresno to Tahoe, Crescent city to San Diego, 
that we're getting really tired of all of this division that is being sold to us. And make no mistake, there's a lot of money being made from keeping you and I from telling the same story. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's rural versus urban, whether it's northern versus southern, or probably the big one, which is red versus blue, right? Like, we are Californians, and we, and we can do whatever we put our minds to. You know, you think about the infrastructure in the past 170 years that we've influenced the state, the natural processes of the state with. I mean, what we've done with water rivals anything humans have done with anything in the whole history of humanity in 170 years. And that great achievement will only be matched again by how that infrastructure changes over the next 170 years, probably a lot less than that too. So we have a lot of important conversations to have, keep having those conversations, keep the discourse alive, keep democracy alive. All right. <laughs> we are, we, we basically put your feet in the water and I love that Hillary recommends the middle fork of the Yuba River as a place mm. to, begin to put your feet in the water. Um, yes, so yes, yes. We're going to there are questions just about like what's coming next for Obi. I want to direct everyone to his we've got links to the walk now here in the comments. We've got links to Obi's um, books and upcoming books as part of this incredible series that he's doing and so I'm going to let you guys explore that. Um and say a big thank you to Obi and Matt. Also, forgive me reaching onto my ground here, but um, you can read an, a beautiful excerpt of um, The Force of California in the current issue of Ulta, which you can um, you can actually grab a, if you're not a subscriber, feel free to go to ultaonline.com or you can just buy this issue um, and uh, check out a, a beautiful excerpt, a collector's edition, I, I'll, decide excerpt of um, Obi's work. Uh, if you're, I encourage everyone to stick with us every Wednesday at 1230. Next week, we will have author, short story author, um, and educator Keenan Norris in conversation with the incredible Susan Strait. Um, the two of the, Keenan has a, a beautiful kind of a autobiographical fictional essay in the current issue as well. It's just an extraordinary piece. So I really encourage you guys to join us Wednesday, November 4th at 1230 right here at Crowdcast. A big, again, Matt, thank you so much for doing this and for your beautiful work in Alta. And Obi, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's always inspiring and fun to get to talk to you. You've been so kind, my friend. Thank you, Alta, for everything that, uh, that, um, you've done and matt i'm looking forward to seeing you maybe next year you know we're going to begin construction on liberty crossing wildlife crossing you know right. the, the biggest the biggest wildlife crossing in the world is happening yeah. right there right there north of your north of your uh you know uh across the 101 bridging right. the two uh separated sections of the santa monica mountains there and uh through through agora hills perhaps saving a uh the uh, saving us from an extirpation of the mountain lion in that region of yeah. the world. So a mountain lion two weeks ago uh, in the mountains over here. So yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. The the problem is not really their uh, their numbers, no. but but in fact the genetic bottleneck to, that they are that they find themselves in, and right. and this wildlife crossing by itself might be enough to turn that tide. Mm -hmm. So okay, yeah, that's 2021. Let's do an Alta asks live mm -hmm. on the on the Animal Crossing when that happens too. Oh, that's good. And then we got to go up oh. north, and we and we got to get the Klamath. We got to get the Klamath Dam removed too. That is a piece of colonial violence that is ongoing up there. We have to. It's our last best chance to save California salmon, and we have to. We have to get that dam breached. Those four dams actually, and the deals have already been done. Everybody's just dragging their feet with legalities as we do. Oh my God, someone came from the Appalachians. Thank you, Shannon, Boston, Washington State, Palo Alto. This is so rad. We're pulling them all in. Oh, um, that's so wonderful. This, if you missed any part of this or want to rewatch it, it'll be up on altaonline.com later this afternoon. Again, many, many, many thanks, guys. Please take care, stay safe, vote, and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you, friends. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks.